Um, this is a reminder, this is the same slide as the end of the last one, so that you don't have to keep going back to that slide. This is the regulars. Um, really, I'm going to teach you. These are what we're going to go over and what I need you to write your problem cards for. But what I want you to do, instead of writing one for each one, write a bradycardia one, write an atrial dysrhythmias one, write a ventricular dysrhythmias one, and write a pulseless dysrhythmias card. Because all the interventions are the same for those categories. Okay? So don't remember all the stuff for just a fifth. It's all for atrial arrhythmias. We just ramp it up based on how bad it is. But they all have the same interventions. So don't overwhelm yourself. Make four cards if you want. Or you can split them all up if you love making notes. Um, but really, they go into these four categories. So we will know by the end of this how to recognize and how to treat each one of these rhythms. Can you imagine that by 2 o'clock you will be proficient in this? I have been teaching rhythms for a long, long time, and I have found that there is stuff that just needs to be coagulated together. But what we're going to do is we're going to go through the bradycardias first. Now, you see all the blocks are there. I am going to teach them to you, but I am going to give you a little bit of relief and that I will not put blocks on the test, okay? I'm not going to test you on the blocks. So first degree, second degree, the two types of secondary and the third degree, I will go over them, but they are not on the test, but there are many people in here who do want to go on to ICU ED, and you should know a basic, a little bit about the blocks. Um, so I will put those in there, but if they are Greek or Latin and you have no idea what is going on, that's perfectly fine. You can just let that slide out and just know that if you do want to end up in telemetry or ICU, ED, um, or NICU, or any monitoring area, that you will probably need to know them and kind of put that in the back of your mind. Um, atrials, though, I will want you to know those, ventriculars. So what we're going to have to do is you're going to have to identify it, and you're going to have to treat it. So just like when we're talking about, you know, recognizing it and, you know, watch it and all those things, we'll go with it. But recognizing it is what we will do, and then we'll talk about the treatments for each class. So before we talk about any rhythms, here's how we distinguish between whether something is watchable or intervenable, okay? A lot of arrhythmias, we just are like, ha, look at that. And we just continue to look at that to see if it's getting worse. Here are your symptoms for any EKG problem that something is getting worse. And so are we going to slam meds and electricity into someone who has a stable blood pressure and no shortness of it? Probably not. Okay? We will only really intervene if things are getting worse. So many, many rhythms we just look at and we're like, huh, look at that. That's interesting. We're going to keep an eye on that. What we're keeping an eye on is for this. Okay? So if you are a patient that has an irregular rhythm, the first thing you need is to go see the patient, all right? If you go winging a drug cart and a code cart and meds down to a room where the patient's like, what? <laughs> You're going to be just hyping yourself up for nothing. Go see your patient. And guess what the key assessments are going to be when you have an irregular heart rate? Blood pressure. Ask them if they're short of breath. Ask them if they're kind of dizzy. Those are your key assessments. You're going to have an irregular rhythm. You need to know if it is something that is a problem or something that we're just going to be like, huh, I have had a patient got a heart rate of 38. And I'm like, yeah, we're good because everything's okay. 
I'm watching it, but we're good for right now. We're not slamming a bunch of stuff into them. Every single heart patient. So if you get a patient with an irregular arrhythmia on a test, if there's a lot of information around it, I'm going to want to know whether this patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic. Okay? Symptomatic would be the fact that the heart is not pumping. This irregular rhythm has screwed up the flow. And now the flow is not working great. So if this arrhythmia is screwing up the flow through the heart, then we need to intervene and fix it. Okay? So if you're getting lack of blood flow to the brain, you're getting dizzy. If you're having chest pain, that's lack of the blood flow to the heart. Our heart feeds itself first. The first blood vessel in the aorta is to the coronary arteries. So it feeds itself first with the most freshest oxygenated blood and it feeds the brain second. So if we are having chest pain and an arrhythmia, we have a problem because something is not even getting to nourishing itself. Uh, shortness of breath, of course, we're not pumping through oxygenated blood and the um, diaphoresis means that they are sweating, they're starting to have a sympathetic response like something's wrong and a decreased blood pressure. So any of these, so if your patient's like got an irregular rhythm and they're like, yeah, I'm a little, I'm a little dizzy, that's symptomatic. Oh, yeah, it's a little pressure, a little pain, that's symptomatic. Any of them, any of these, more than one makes you very symptomatic, right? If you're dizzy and short of breath, that makes you very symptomatic. We're gonna go to interventions if they are symptomatic. So really be able to tell if your patient is symptomatic or not. So your patient has a heart rate of 40. What's the first thing you're gonna do? Go assess the patient. Because someone that runs 18 marathons a year and is asleep, 40's okay. They're okay, they're not symptomatic. We will continue to monitor it. We're not gonna be throwing the interventions for a slow heart rate on them. They're okay, they're tolerating it. But if at any sign they grow a sign or symptom, we will intervene. Okay, so that's a pretty big Q slide. Um, this is just something that we will just point out in case you don't know what's all involved in a fall risk, basically. Any patient with any arrhythmia, we will put them on risk, fall risk precautions because they could become symptomatic at any point. We don't want them to fall, right? So the patient with a heart rate of 40 who's in a, like, we're like, oh, we're okay. But you could still put them on fall risk precautions because if that became symptomatic. We don't want them to fall out of bed or anything because they could become dizzy. So just that's kind of fall risk precautions. So if you see fall risk, that's just there when we do the interventions. Um, you can go back to that slide. So let's talk about the bradycardias. The first one, sinus bradycardia. And let's look at it. So what we're going to do is identify each one, and then we'll talk about the interventions for each one. So um, these are the causes of all the kinds of bradycardias, bradycardias or blocks. These are the causes. So we would want to know on the teach for about it what the causes were so that we know what to prevent them from coming back. So if they are athletic or asleep, they may just slow the heart rate down. Maybe they don't need to perfuse as much. Um, there's a lot of causes for them, but most of them are anything that some meds that block your cardiac conduction any of those meds that block it, so beta blockers. We're blocking the signal for increased conduction, so those can cause bradycardias. Narcotic sedatives can slow things down, some antipsychotics, cholinergic meds, so there are meds that slow things down. Anything that works on the vagus system, remember the sympathetic system does what to your heart rate? Ups it, and the vagus system is rest and digest, slows everything down. So if we are stimulating the vagal system, we will have a lower heart rate. <coughs> so what is one of the things that we can do that's a completely small intervention for someone that's got a high heart rate to slow it down? <coughs> we tell them to bear down. Bear down like you're taking the poop. Just bear down. Because what's that going to do? It's going to stimulate the vagal system and slow your heart rate down. So anything that stimulates the vagal system could cause a bradycardia because you're slowing the heart rate down. There are some medicines that directly decrease the heart rate, um, and those would be cause bradycardias as well. But you could put those in your teach about it, because if your patient has a bradycardia, you would want to know why after you've intervened or while you're watching it, so that you can tell your patient why this is happening. Okay. Um, here's how to recognize it. So I'm going to take that excellent advice. <laughs> oh, how perfect is that? 
Okay. So we have a heart rate less than 60. So how do we count easily and quickly? This is a six-second strip. Every strip I give you is a six-second strip. So you count how many R's there are and multiply times 10. So one, two, three, four times 10. 40. Hey, we fit. Anything less than 60 is considered bradycardic. Um, it is regular. If we measure the R to R's, it's regular. They're the same. The R to R distance is the same, so it's regular. There's not one short and one long. They're regular. So it's always less than 60. It's always regular. Well, not always. Sinus bradycardia. Sinus means that it's pretty regular. There's just one thing wrong with it. Normal sinus rhythm is everything's normal. Sinus bradycardia, everything's normal except it's slow. Sinus tachycardia, everything's normal except it's fast. So this one, everything normal except the rate. Your rate is less than 60. But if we're doing our systematic thing, regular R to R, are there P waves present? Yep, one, two, yep, P waves before every QRS. We're great. The PR width is normal. We could count this if we wanted to. And we have a P computer, that box, and then all the way to the R and to this box. So we have one, two, three, four, five boxes. Is that normal? Three to five is normal, so our PR is normal. And our QR width, we have starting here and going to here. That's about 0 0.04 or 0 0.06. So we're normal there. Everything is normal except for your rate. We have a sinus bradycardia. So if you see the word sinus in front of it, it means everything's normal. Okay? Sinus means everything normal. If it's a sinus bradycardia, everything normal except the rate. Sinus tachycardia, everything normal except the rate. It's too fast. And normal sinus rhythm, everything's normal. All right. So that's the bradycardia. Then we go to the blocks. This is where you can check out if you don't want to know. <laughs> but if you do want to know, there are four of them. Um, there is a little poem for them. I'm not good at memorizing poems. So um, the problem with the first degree, so basically if we're looking at this, our first thing is, is it regular? So we look at the R to R interval. Is it regular? And I will tell you this one is yes. The R to R interval is regular. Um, are there P's before every QRS? Well, there's P's, but they're really long before the QRS. We're like, hmm, that's not right. But that is, the, that is the sign of a first degree heart block. Everything is normal. The rate is, could be normal or slow. They're usually normal. And the reason I put them in the bradycardia is, is because that's when they cause a problem, is when they get lower than 60. You can have a first degree heart block with a rate of 80. That's why I didn't put the rate up there. It's not necessarily bradycardia, but it's treated as a bradycardia because we only treat it if it's slowing the heart rate down. Okay? So that's why I put it in the bradycardia section. They don't necessarily always have a heart rate below 60, but when the heart rate goes below 60 is when we start to treat it or think about treating it. But the only problem with this one is the PR interval is more than five boxes. Okay? Everything else is okay. The PR interval is long. So that's a first degree heart block. The second degrees are where it is a little confusing. The second degree, is it regular? It is not regular because we got this long thing here, short thing, there's medium things, there's things that are kind of all over the place, so it's not regular. So we look at it and then we go to our next stop. So we just write your regular. What's our next stop to see if there's a P before every QRS, right? So P, QRS. P, QRS, P, QRS, P, QRS, P, QRS, P, QRS. You're like, okay, yes, there are P's and there is a P before every QRS. But it was irregular. That didn't fit. So when it is irregular and there's a P before every QRS, you're like, huh. Because the only other irregular rhythms are atrial rhythms and they don't have a problem with the P. So we'll see that in a minute. But you're like, okay. Well, there's a P before the QRS. So let's do the PR interval. It's our next check, right? We did a regular check. It didn't check out. We did the P before the QRS. That checked out. But now we're going to do the PR width. 
And we measure and we're like, okay, we've got, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six blocks. Okay, a little long. One, two, three, four, five, six blocks. Okay, a little long. Oh, wait, one, two, wait, that got really long. That looks like that's about almost ten blocks, like about eight blocks. And then, oh my gosh, really, really, really long. Like, one, two, three, four, that's twenty some blocks. That's a lot of blocks. And then we go back to right, you know, back to there, right there. So longer, 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 and then a drop is a winky block. So the PR interval gets longer and longer and longer, and then like it kind of drops out a QRS, and then it resets itself. Longer, longer, longer than a drop is a winky block. So that's a type one, and really, I mean, if you want to memorize them, there you go. Second degree type one is longer, longer, longer than you drop. This one, second degree type two, is another dropped beat, and you can tell because it's irregular, but with a P wave before every QRS. You look at P, QRS, P, QRS, P, QRS, P. Oh, wait a minute. There's a missing QRS. If there's a missing QRS, it's probably second degree type two. So you see we have P, QRS, P, QRS, P, QRS, P, uh-oh, P, QRS. If it's just a dropped beat out of nowhere with no lengthening, this PR interval did not lengthen. We have one, two, three, four, five, six blocks. One, two, three, four, five, six blocks. One, two, it just drops out of nowhere. That is a winky box. So longer, longer, longer than a drop. It's a winky box. The other one is it just drops with no warning whatsoever. It's just like I'm dropping a beat randomly. And that's a second degree heart block. And so we worry about that one because that could progress to the third degree, which one is a little more difficult. Let's go through our thing. And we're like, is it irregular? What was the problem with the second degrees? They were irregular, right? The third degree is not irregular. The third degree is regular. So you're like, what makes this not a regular rhythm? Are R to R is regular? Is there a P wave before every QRS? Yep, 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 yep. Okay, there's P wave before every QRS. Let's look at our PR interval. That's the next one, right? So now we have, this is, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven blocks. This one is one, two, three blocks. This one is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So wait a minute. It's not longer, 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 and there's no drop, so it can't be winky block. It's not dropping randomly, because nothing's being dropped. It's not a prolonged PR interval just consistently, so it's not a first degree, it doesn't fit any of the criteria. But what is happening here in this third degree heart block? This is called disassociation, atrial ventricular disassociation. This ventricle is doing its own thing, and this atria is doing its own thing, and they don't talk to each other. The danger in this one is that you are completely dependent. There is no pacemaker cell. What the pacemaker cell was in the atrium, right? This atrium is just doing its own thing, wandering its away, but the ventricle can't respond to it because it can't hear it, and it's just doing its own thing. Well, a normal ventricle rate is pretty low, and this one's actually hanging out there, doing a pretty good job of this ventricle as being very healthy, because remember, all the cardiac cells can be pacemaker cells. So when there's no end stimulus from the atrium, the ventricle starts doing its own thing. But the danger with this one is there are no pacemaker cells that work, and the ventricle's pacing itself, which fails pretty quickly. The ventricle gets tired because it's not its job usually. So what we see in this one is um, the P to P's are exactly the same. If we march these out, they're exactly the same. This one, the P kind of got buried in there. But if you march out the P's, they're very regular. 
and the QRSs, the RRs is very regular, but they're not talking to each other. It's complete disassociation. Third degree block, though, doesn't fit any of our criteria. Normal sinus rhythm, a P before every QRS and a normal PR interval. First degree block, P before every QRS but a really long interval. And the first and second degree block are either lengthening or normal and one drops. This one doesn't fit any criteria because we're like long, short, medium, medium, short, medium, medium. It's like kind of random. And so you have to kind of do a double look on it. So again, because they're so tricky and they're so subtle, I'm not gonna test you on it. But I do, if you want more practice with them, you're at least introduced to them. So if you go to any practice sites, you could maybe use this to help you figure it out if you want more. Um, but let's talk about what we do if we have a symptomatic bradycardia. So what are our key interventions when we have an irregular rhythm? What are we gonna look at? Well, first we're gonna watch that EKG. We're gonna make sure if they have an irregular rhythm, maybe on a one-time check, we're gonna to wanna to continuously monitor that rhythm. We're not gonna let that go, okay? If they have an irregular rhythm, we're gonna to wanna to monitor them continuously, whether it's telemetry or on the monitor, we wanna monitor that EKG. Um, why do we care about pulse ox? That will be a sign of a worsening condition. Your pulse ox will drop if you stop perfusing, and that will become symptomatic, right? If you have shorter breath or decreased pulse ox. So cardiac perfusion. We're going to check the blood pressure, the pulses, and the cap refill because that's a sign of a worsening condition, right, is when we start not perfusing as well or we start getting dizzy. Um, and we, why do we want to watch electrolytes on an irregular rhythm? Because calcium, potassium, and magnesium are our conductors. So if they are low, that might be why we're having a conduction problem. So we're going to watch those electrolytes, and then they're probably going to get sent to some tests. So we just want to keep an eye on those answers. But really, the assessments you want to do is put them on an EKG, check their pulse ox, monitor their pulse ox, maybe not continuously, but at least do it every hour or so, see how they're doing, check their shortness of breath and things, get their respirations and their cardiac perfusion. Okay. We're just checking ABCs, really, making sure everything is perfusing. Um, if your patient, so really we're talking about when we split up our interventions into what will fix the problem and what is nice to do, okay? Of this list, what will fix the problem? Of this list, what will fix the problem, do you think? Probably the underlying causes or the meds, okay? That's what will fix the problem. Get rid of the underlying causes or give meds. How do we know which one to do? How do we know which one comes first? We can't give the meds unless we have a problem. We're not gonna medicate or electrocute any of our problems unless they're symptomatic. So if they are any symptomatic and bradycardic, what are we gonna do? Monitor and assess for underlying causes. So if you wanna make a little flow chart for yourself, that's where I would take this. Everybody's like, well, what order do we do it? And I'm like, I don't have an order for you. It depends on your patient. But if you wanted to flow chart it out, what I would say is that asymptomatic, assess for underlying causes, so you would do your assessments, assess for causes, and that's it. Maybe some patient teaching and support. Like, yeah, you have an irregular rhythm. You've got a heart block. That's probably scary to hear but we think you have a heart block because of this, and we're watching this and this and this to see if it gets worse. You would be comforted if your nurse told you that. So that's really, if we are asymptomatic, we go to the monitor side and look for the problems and make sure it doesn't get worse. So you will be constantly rechecking your key assessments and looking for it to get worse. Maybe you would educate your patients on if you feel short of breath or whatever. We're in the monitor side. Let's say we're not in the monitor side. You go in to check your patient. You have a heart rate of 40. Let's just say it's a sinus brady. Maybe it's a first degree block, but your heart rate is 40. And you go in and you ask your patient, how are you feeling? It's like, I'm a little short of breath. And you take your blood pressure and it's 110 over 50 and your SAT's 95. Now what do you want to do? Are they symptomatic? They said they were short of breath. Their blood pressure's okay, but they have one of the symptoms. 
They're short of breath. And so are we going to intervene? Their SATs are 95. Maybe normal, maybe not. I don't know. So what do we want to do to intervene on a symptomatic patient? Well, I would love to possibly give some meds because they're symptomatic because that's going to fix the problem. What's the first med that we can do that's very easy for us to put on? Oxygen is the first med that we can put on. Now, everybody asks me, do you have to have an order for oxygen? ABC things, we are forgiven if we fix a lot of ABC things. So we can put the head of the bed down if the blood pressure's low. We can do a couple of nursing interventions. Oxygen is a little gray intervention, but I don't know of any doctor that would be upset with you with putting oxygen on a possible arrhythmia. It is the first drug of choice. It is available at our bedside. Go ahead and slap some oxygen on your patient, even if you don't have an order. Because in the 15, 20 minutes, and I had a student come back and say, if there's one thing I wish I had known from Sim is that you weren't screwing around with us when you had us calling the answering service. He goes, I thought you were kidding and being mean. He goes, you know how long it takes someone to get back to you from the answering service? I'm like, I know, that's what we were trying to train you. He's like, I thought you were being mean. But um, in the time that it takes someone to get back to you is 20, 30 minutes, go ahead and put some oxygen on. Okay, you're not gonna go throw in drugs into somebody unless they're coding, but you can use oxygen, okay? It is a gray area. Um, in the NCLEX world, they're gonna assume that you have everything at your disposal to treat the problem, and they wanna know what you're gonna do first, and it's probably gonna be oxygen. Because really what we wanna do is any heart that is symptomatic or in distress, we wanna decrease its workload, okay? It's telling you it's symptomatic. It's telling you it's not flowing well. So we want to decrease its workload. So give the oxygen if it's SATs are less than 95 or short of breath. If this patient's short of breath and SATs are 95, they can get some oxygen. Um, cluster your patient care. This is not the time to get them up for a walk. Adequate rest periods, calm, quiz, and put them on rest precautions. But these are not going to fix the problem. They're just there to kind of help out, okay, to support. What's really going to fix the problem are your four meds. And I'm going to give you a nice little thing. Medicine before Edison. Edison being electricity. Medicine before Edison. We never bring electricity into the scenario unless the medicines have not worked. So what I'm going to say for bradycardias, these are your two meds. Oxygen is a med for every arrhythmia. But your two meds that are specific for bradycardia are going to be atropine and dopamine. So we talk a little bit about each med. Ah, magic. So if you have a bradycardia, any kind, and the blocks usually block down to something slow, which makes them symptomatic, and then we will treat them the same way. Every block or brady, if it is symptomatic, these are our meds in escalating form. Okay. So have we heard about these meds before? This is a little bit, if you want to put it into your medication card, this is basically some brief stuff about each med so that you know how to give them safely. Um, these are, and this is what I would kind of point out, I would have you do with each med too. When you're looking at side effects of meds, what do we expect and not worry about? And what do we like, oh, that's not good. And anaphylaxis, of course, is any worrisome side effect. But so I'm not going to put that on every single med. Um, but if they start getting tachycardic or hypotensive, then wait a minute, we've done too much of that med or something's not quite right. Um, but we do expect them to have pupil dilation and all this stuff. Because what does atropine do? It's going to decrease your heart rate. And how does atropine decrease your heart rate? It's going to block that vagus stimulation. So, you know, beta blockers block sympathetic, which slows everything down. Well, atropine's gonna block the vagus, which is going to ramp everything up, right? Yeah. So it's gonna block that, it's gonna ramp everything up, but because it's a rest digest blocker, it's gonna block that digest stuff too. So you start drying up your secretions and you start having decreased bowel sounds and things like that. And it's going to also, 
cause urinary retention because that's kind of a rest and digest system. So it's basically blocking the vagus systems, blocking that parasympathetic, it's blocking rest and digest. It's gonna send you a little bit into the ramped up stage. And so that might be where some of your signs and symptoms come from. So we expect that, that's what we just did. But we don't want it going too bad and we don't want you getting tachycardic and causing problems with it. Um, dopamine is a continuous IV infusion, which you may or may not have seen. Um, I named my first cat Dopamine because he raised my blood pressure because he was always all over everything. So we named him Dopey and he was named after Dopamine. And my second cat we named um, Dippy because he was like so laid back that we named him Propofol or Diprovan. So we named him Dopey and Dippy. But um, my first cat was Dopamine because he raised my blood pressure. Dopamine stimulates the sympathetic system, which means it's going to ramp you up a little bit. So it's going to increase your heart rate. At higher doses, it increases your blood pressure. It is a pure um, heart med. It just works on the heart until you get higher doses of it, and then the higher doses of it do heart and blood pressure. But at lower doses, it will stimulate the heart and cause an increased heart rate. So if we have a low heart rate, we want to increase the heart rate. And those are the two meds that will increase the heart rate without causing too much trouble. Okay? Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So that's Brady's, which are any blocks, and sinus bradycardia. If we need to, none of those meds work. Atropine doesn't work. Dopamine works, or it works and it stopped working. We started going back into the bradycardic stage. Or the block got so bad that things are, it's, you, now you're blocking down to like 20 or 30, and the patient's very symptomatic. Then we move on to Edison, and the Edison for bradycardias is a pacemaker. Okay, we don't shock it, we don't put paddles on it, we will pace it. Because what's the problem in a bradycardia? Our pacemaker cells have either dead or slowed down. So we need to pace it. So the Edison for bradycardias is a pacemaker. So when we do those things, it's oxygen, atropine, dopamine, and a pacemaker. There are really four things that fix a bradycardic problem. And so that's it. You can do, when we say pacemakers, um, there are temporary pacemakers and there are permanent pacemakers. When you go, if you go into a cardiac unit, you may see this one over here is a, this is a temporary one that we can do very quickly and immediately. It's actually done off of the defibrillator, but we're not shocking the patient with, we are sinking it or using the paddles for low dose electricity, which is basically going to stimulate the heart to go. So this is a temporary, it's called transcutaneous because it's through the skin, transcutaneous pacing. They can put a pacemaker in through the vein or through the femoral. They can put pacemakers in either way. They basically thread, just like a central line, a catheter down to the heart and stick an electrode in the heart and let it, let it do its thing and stimulate the heart. So that's transvenous because it's going through the vein. So you can transcutaneously through the skin. You can transvenous through the vein. And then you can put in more permanent pacemakers, or if you've been on a cardiac surgery unit, they will actually implant little electrodes into the heart muscle from the outside. You may see, if you had a post-cardiac surgery patient, that you may see electrodes coming out from the chest wall. That's because they've opened the chest, and they went ahead and put electrodes in, but they're temporary. And then you can go in through the cath lab, and they can actually put in a permanent pacemaker. There are multiple kinds of pacemakers, and whichever one they get is how long they think that problem's gonna last. If they think this problem is going to exist for the rest of their lives, they'll get a permanent pacemaker. If it's something that they think maybe you got too much of a med or something and it will wear off, they'll do something temporary. But remember, we don't go to the pacemaker unless the medicine hasn't worked. So they'll probably try a dose of atropine or something and if it doesn't work. And there are certain conditions, certain blocks that we won't want to give them atropine, but don't worry about all that. You'll get all that if you go to a tele or a, a, a specialty unit. I just want you to know that pacemakers are the case for it. Um, if you do see it, again, I'm probably not gonna test you on what is involved in a pacemaker, but um, if you do see a pacemaker, basically there is a machine, a generator, that sends electricity out to these electrodes, and then the heart has to respond to this electricity that's been given to it by creating a beat. Um, so they, the doctor will order all three of these things. They'll order a mode, which is 
which chamber is paste and which chamber is scent, they should be the same thing. Because if you put a pacemaker into the right ventricle, you better be sensing the right ventricle too because that's how a pacemaker works is it goes until it's told not to by the heart. So basically a pacemaker will just send electricity out unless it hears from the heart that it's doing something. So you always pace and sense the same chamber. So AAI means that it's in the atrium. V means it's in the ventricle. D means it's in both. So you have wires in the atrium and the ventricle. Don't worry about I's and O's and all that stuff. I just like you to know where the pacemaker is. If it says AAI or VV something, that means the electrode's only in one chamber. If it says D, it's dual, meaning there's an electrode in the ventricle and the atrium. Um, the rate is ordered by the physician, and basically the pacemaker will watch the heart, and if the heart rate drops below the set rate, then it starts sending signals to go. Um, and then the electricity is a drug. It's ordered by the physician, and so the physician will decide um, 10 milliamps, 15 milliamps. The amount of electricity depends on the way you're giving it. If you're giving it through the skin, if you're in the ER, and you may see them pace someone through there, that's higher electricity amounts. It's usually 70 or 80 or 90 milliamps of electricity because it takes a lot to get through the skin and the chest muscles to stimulate the heart. When we defibrillate people, what is the energy? 260, 300 joules. That's a lot. Um, so when we pace, it's a lot less. You know, 70. Nice and gentle. It hurts a little bit, but not nearly as bad as getting shocked. But it is tiny shocks if you're transcutaneously pacing. Um, when the electrode is directly embedded in the muscle wall, a lot less electricity. It's like 10 milliamps or something. Tiny little bit of electricity. The sensitivity is something that we adjust. And again, I'm not going to test you, but if you go to see a pacemaker, here is some troubleshooting. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. If you need more on the pacemaker, you let me know. I'm not going to have you read pacer <coughs> rhythms. But basically, this is just something that we see if the heart and the pacer are talking well together. And we adjust the sensitivity of the generator of the pacemaker to read the heart better. So um, you can read this through, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because we're not going to test you on it. But if you want more information, like I said, if you want 12 leads, more advanced cardiac or pacers, let me know, and I will provide something a little extra. If we'd had the 104, I'd probably put it in there. But I'm not going to test you on that. So what do you think we want to put onto a bradycardic card? If we were going to do a problem card, what would we be, what are our key assessments? What are we watching on a bradycardic patient? The EKG, the pulse ox, the blood pressure, and our perfusion, our pulses and our cap refill and stuff. Whether they're short of breath, whether they're dizzy, all the symptomatic stuff, because we want to make sure that they're not getting worse. Um, if they are not symptomatic, we will monitor and assess for causes. If they are symptomatic, we will go to oxygen. What are the two meds? Atropine. Atropine and dopamine. And then if those don't work, a pacemaker. Okay? That's pretty much bradycardia is in a nutshell. Um, I just really need you to know that a heart rate less than 60 counts as a bradycardia. Okay. Sinus tachycardia is its own little thing because it's normal, but the heart rate is fast. So everything normal except the rate. R to R's are regular. There's a P before every QRS. The PR interval is the same. We can measure those out. Um, and our QRS width is normal. Everything's normal. But what's the rate? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Times 10. It's 140. It's really fast. But everything's normal, but it's really fast. What do we do about it? Well, the only thing we do about it is underlying cause. If they're symptomatic, we'll add oxygen and rate control. Okay? Tachycardia is usually cause-based. Sinus tachycardia, there's a problem behind it. Everything's normal. It's not a conduction problem. Something's just making our heart beat fast. 
So here's a list of everything that makes a heartbeat fast, and love's not on there. But um, anyway, so see if your patients have any of these things going on. But if they're tachycardic and you're like, I'm short of breath, well, then we're going to put oxygen on them. And then if we can't get the cause under control, then we will give some meds. And those meds are rate control meds. And here they are. Here are your two top two rate control meds. Guess what? The hypertensive meds come back to bite you in the butt again. You're never going to get rid of the antihypertensive meds. They're back. So um, beta blockers. Of course, why would we give a beta blocker to a fast heart rate? <laughs> yeah. I put, <laughs> there you go. You'll never forget beta blockers or OLALs again because there's a cat in me. Um, but beta blockers will block your heart rate and slow it down. Um, calcium channel blockers, I don't know if you had, like, oh, there's no ending that works, but they have very nice drugs. Verapamil, diltiazem, and nifedipine are the two, the three big calcium channel blockers. There are other ones, of course, but those are our biggest ones, and um, those are great. And why do you think calcium channel blockers will slow down our heart rate? Because calcium's our contractility thing, so it's going to slow it down, it's going to relax it. Kind of like calcium channel blockers relax our blood pressure and make our blood pressure drop. So, of course, we're going to worry if they start having hypotension. We're going to worry if these things have blocked down our heart rate to the point where it's not flowing well. What if we shut down our, we block calcium to the point that the contractility is no good? Well, we're going to end up with edema and stuff like that because things aren't going through. Everything's backing up in that venous system. Um, but we do want to slow things down. But wouldn't the best way to slow things down be to get rid of the cause? Especially if your causes are pain, anxiety, fever, hypoxia. Fix the cause and you'll get rid of the tachycardia if it's sinus tachycardia. Okay? But if you cannot fix the cause, then we would go to the, the blockers. The blockers and the calcium channels. Those are betas and calcium channel blockers. That's it for sinus tachycardia. Know the causes, know the meds. Atrial, so let's talk about the atrials. And then we'll take a little break for you to digest everything. Um, these four are our atrials. These are meaning the problem stems from the atrium. So premature atrial contractions, AFib, a flutter, and sup supraventricular, meaning uh, the answer's there, above the ventricle. What's above the ventricle? The atrium. So they should just call it atrial tachycardia, but I don't know. Supraventricular, above the atrium, above the ventricle, meaning the atrium is tachycardic. Okay? So let's look at them. Here's your causes. Um, there could be any number of causes. Most of them are all things that would um, cause the atrium to be damaged somehow. Stimulants are just going to kind of stimulate everything and kind of mess up your conduction, which is why I never let my children drink energy drinks. I'm watching all of you. Mm -hmm. Have you heard about the girl in Mexico that died on the beach when she was 17 because she was dehydrated and drinking energy drinks? Watch it. If you have palpitations, the first thing I'm going to ask you is, do you have an energy drink today? Yeah. Yes, yeah, stupid. So... <laughs> So if you're drinking high amounts of caffeine and following it up with some drinks and all that good stuff, yeah, you're going to have palpitations. I don't feel bad for you. It's like, oh, well, stop that. Um, but underlying heart disease, this could be cutting off blood flow and causing problems in your atrium. Basically, any problems that will affect your atrium could cause atrial dysrhythmias, okay? So other than you being stupid, we kind of feel bad for them. We'll try and treat them. Um, so let's look at what they are. This is a PAC, premature atrial contraction. This is probably what you're going to see if you're doing a lot of stimulants or things like that. These are your palpitations, flutters. There, it's a normal sinus rhythm except for this random little dude just happening here. Um, so what we have is, is it going to be regular? I'm going to tell you most of the atrial dysrhythmias are not regular, okay? The bradyparty is either or because blocks aren't regular. 
but most of these atrial ones are not regular. Um, so first of all, it doesn't, the rate could be anything. Um, it is not regular, so the first test is not regular. So when a rhythm is not regular, I want you to go in your mind to atrial problem. Then there's, a, there's blocks, but then we'll rule it out and send it to a block if it needs to go there. Um, P waves. Yes, there's P waves. P, Q, R, S. Oh, what's that? Is that an upside down P wave? Is that a P wave? I don't know. P, Q, R, S. I'm not really sure what that thing is. P, Q, R, S. So really the P should look the same. Okay, the P should look the same. So anything that is not the same, what's happening here is that the P wave was starting, but then this, the ventricle got excited by the P wave and went ahead and went. It got stimulated. And then it got stimulated early by this premature atrial contraction. So notice that it happens pretty fast after the P wave. It hasn't quite finished. It's not supposed to be there yet, and it looks weird. Okay? They don't look weird. Those P waves, these are not, just because this one is upright and this one's upside down, you don't have to spend a lot of time thinking about it. It's not normal. It's not a normal P wave. So we're not going to call it a P wave. It doesn't look like the other ones, so it's not a P wave. So we're going to say no, there are no P waves before every QRS, because sometimes it's just a QRS with this random little thing in front of it. So we're not going to call it regular. It lost its regular, and it lost its P waves, because those P waves are not all uniform. Okay? Do we see where these P waves look different? Mm -hmm. They're not even P waves. This is just like a, a messed up beat there. That's a messed up beat. Um, the nice thing to remember about all these, all the atrial rhythms have narrow, normal QRSs. Narrow, normal QRSs. So... If there's something funky going on and it's irregular with a narrow normal QRS, the only two things it could be is an atrial problem or a block. And remember, all the blocks had normal P waves, just problems with the P, you know, like the lengths of the P waves, but they had normal P waves. This is an abnormal P wave. It puts it right into the atrial problem. As soon as you have an abnormal P wave, you can just classify it into the atrial dysrhythmias. Abnormal P waves with narrow normal QRSs make it an atrial problem. Um, so we do have some regular P waves, so we're just going to call it a PAC. Because we have normal P waves and abnormal P waves, we're just going to call them PACs. All right, because I'm going to show you what AFib looks like. Here's AFib, you've seen that. This is a wavy. We don't even spend a lot of time looking for a P wave. One, it's irregular. So irregular puts us into the atrial category unless we have those normal P waves that maybe move us into the block category. But irregular, I want you to sort it, as soon as it's irregular, into atrial. And the only way to move it out of atrial is to have normal P waves with varying lengths. But this is irregular. And do you see P waves? Maybe you could make a case for that. Don't try to make cases for P waves. If they are not beautiful little P waves, they're not normal. Okay? This is abnormal. This is a wavy baseline, and it is fibrillating. Just like if we were missing these, we would be ventricular fibrillating. But this is an atrial fibrillation. Our ventricles are doing their job. Basically what's happening is those atrium are so excited, they're just going off all the time, and the ventricle's like, I really have no idea which one to respond to. I'm just going to guess. And it just kind of goes randomly. Um, but the signals that are making it through are irregular. And the ventricle, narrow, normal. The ventricle's not having a problem. The atrium's having a problem. So no P waves that I can tell that are normal. And if there was like perfect P waves and then something weird, one or two beats, then we could call it premature atrial contraction, but there's nothing normal in that P waves, don't you think? That's all just noise. So our um, P waves, no, we've got a wavy baseline. Wavy P waves, where the PR interval should be, it's just waves. It's just waves. The P wave before every QRS, no, I don't have any P waves. And my QRS is narrow and normal. So it's irregular, narrow normal QRS, 
it's solidly in my atrial problem, and this wavy baseline makes it atrial fibrillation because the atria is just, da -da 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 -da, just fibrillating. It's not really doing any contracting. It's just fibrillating. Um, the problem we have with all of the atrial things is that if the atria is not contracting effectively, what's happening to all the blood in there? It's just basically like piddling into the ventricle. It's not being contracted and thrown into the ventricle. It's just kind of puddling into the ventricle. And there's a lot of blood left in the atrium. And that blood can clot because there's no contraction happening. So any of our atrial problems, we're at high risk of blood clots. High, high risk of blood clots. Um, so any atrial problem, that's one of our big concerns is blood clots. Um, and you'll see on the interventions what we do with that. So here's a flutter. So regular, looks regular. So we don't know what to do with it because we're like, we could measure it. They might be a little off by a little bit, but it looks regular. So we're like, huh, okay. But as soon as you get to this section, is there a P before every QRS? Well, you could be like, sure, P before every QRS. But what the heck is this thing going on here? This jaw, this jagged saw-like pattern on your baseline is automatically atrial flutter. Okay? So as soon if you see that wavy baseline in irregular, say fib. I told you all the irregular, this could be irregular, it could be regular, but this right here looks like sawtooth. That makes it a flutter. So if we have multiple ones of those, if you call this normal sinus rhythm, there's extra things in here. This is basically the atrium is fibrillating. It's just contracting a lot. Might not be very effective. Um, it, we treat it exactly the same as AFib. But a flutter has the jagged sawtooth with a narrow normal QRS. Okay? And we can do a couple of practice ones with EKG. ABG Ninja, there's an EKG Ninja as well where we can go through and practice them. Um, and then SVT, well, you might want to call that a sinus tachycardia, right? Because you're like, okay, look sinus. Can't tell. Let's look at the rate. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. There's 18. What's our heart rate? 180. So SVT, we don't know. That heart rate is greater than 150. That's gone beyond, Tacker. I don't know if this is sinus or not. This does not have enough time to even show me. I don't know if that's a P wave or a T wave. I have no idea what this is. It's too fast. Anything greater than 150, we just shove into the SVT category. But it has a narrow, normal QRS. So it could be sinus tack. It could be something atrial that got too fast. It's too fast to tell. And I will tell you that a heart rate greater than 150 does not perfuse very well. Because guess what? We were doing a heart rate of about 10 or 20 going through the room. A heart rate of 150, there is no time to fill the ventricles. There's no time for the ventricles. As soon as like a little bit happens, it starts again. And it's like, ah, there's, no, there's hardly any flow once your heart gets above 150. Well, yeah, but guess what happens in exercise? What happens in exercise to your body? If you exercise too long and too hard, what happens to your body? It starts producing lactate. And why does it produce lactate? Because you're not providing enough oxygen to your body. So if you exercise at a heart rate of 180 for an hour or two, you're going to collapse in lactic acidosis because your heart cannot pump that well for that long. So yes, if you're in the middle of a giant treadmill test and you're walking up the slope at you know, 10 and your heart rate's 200 because you're doing something, okay, well, then we're going to continue to monitor because it had better come down as soon as you stop exercising. But people who are exercising at a heart rate of 180, 200 for very long are going to pass out because you're not circulating well. And so yes, you can do it for a while, but think about it. If you do it, for an hour, you're going you're gonna to stop compensating. 
your heart is not producing well. And if you're a healthy person, your heart's doing a lot better. Um, if you have um, heart failure and this happens, you're not compensating for long at all. You're comp you know, you don't, pass, you don't live very long past this. It's not very good for your blood flow. Most of these patients are symptomatic. If you tried to exercise with your heart rate up above at 180 for a long time, you're going to get dizzy. You're going to get weak. You're going to start feeling a little sick to your stomach unless you've been doing it for a long time and you've conditioned your heart to get used to that kind of speed. But most people are not conditioned for that kind of speed. So yes, it could be normal if you are highly athletic and you're in the middle of an exercise activity. But don't normal athletic people, if they have trained their heart, don't respond that fast. Their heart gets stronger with each beat so that you don't go into that high of a speed. Correct? I mean, if we've trained really well. So yes, no, our heart doesn't do well at 150 and above. Not for long periods. So try it. Go home, run on the <laughs> treadmill. But don't call me and say, <laughs> you told me to. But if you would like to experience what SVT feels like, sure, go ramp up your heart rate. And I would tell you, you don't feel very good after a while. You can't maintain it for a long time. Your body will tell you to stop. It's not that good. Um, so anyway, what we need to do with SVT is we need to slow it down pretty quickly to figure out what's going on underneath it. So you may see in people's charts, AFib with RVR. Have you ever seen that in someone's chart? Yeah. This is also called rapid ventricular response, SVT. So basically they come in with SVT, they slow it down, and they find out the underlying problem is AFib. Then they reclassify it as AFib with rapid ventricular rate. But we don't know what this one is. If we just saw this, we would go in and see the patient, take a blood pressure, ask the patient how they're doing. If it's been going on for a little while, they're probably not going to be feeling that great. It's usually symptomatic. Um, so anything greater than 150, it, we're going to call it an SVT until we've slowed it down to figure out. It may be a sinus tachycardia that got crazy because you were exercising. It may be a sinus tachycardia that got really fast, but we don't know until we slow it down. It's too fast to tell what any of these measurements would be. But it does have a narrow normal QRS, okay? So if your heart rate is anything over 150, I want you to call it an SVT. Once we slow it down below 150, we can maybe tell, is it AFib underneath or is it sinus underneath? But if it's greater than 150, we're gonna call it an SVT if it has a narrow normal QRS, okay? So AFib, is this AFib or A-flutter? It's a flutter because it's got a jaw tooth pattern. I like to think of them as little butterfly wings just fluttering around. Um, wavy baseline, atrial fibrillation, and it's always irregular. AFib's always irregular. It's just random. And then this one is a PAC because it really just doesn't, the P wave's not normal. So, but it's a narrow normal QRS. So we're like, all right, we don't have anything else to call it. It doesn't really have a wavy baseline because there's normal P, there's normal P waves. It doesn't have a flutter baseline, maybe, maybe, but this one's fine. So there's no flutter, there's no wavy, it's irregular, it's not SVT, we're going to throw it into the PAC category, okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, what do we do about these atrial dysrhythmias? Well, you can see that we have our asymptomatic and symptomatic. So we're going to add one more thing, our asymptomatic. So like our flow chart with the Brady's is that we would go in and we would just continue to monitor. We would get to the underlying causes, and that's it. Here, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to continue to monitor. We're going to get to the underlying causes, but we're also going to add anticoagulants and rate control. So even if this patient isn't symptomatic, with an atrial dysrhythmia, we will do anticoagulants, maybe not for the PACs. The PACs is kind of like, eh, depends on how bad they feel. But for AFib, a flutter, and SVT is usually always symptomatic, but AFib and a flutter and maybe SVT if it's not symptomatic, we want to give anticoagulants. And why do we give anticoagulants? To any patient with an atrial dysrhythmia, 
because they have a high risk of blood clots because that atrium is not contracting well. If you have one random PAC in the middle of a normal sinus rhythm, we're probably not going to go right to treatment. But if you're having multiple, many, many PACs, these premature atrial contractions mean that there's not a full contraction going on, which means you have a risk for clots. So probably we're going to do this for any AFib, any A flutter, and frequent, frequent PACs. Okay, because that means our atrium is not contracting efficiently. Anticoagulants. And then rate control if the rates, because some AFibs will go fast and go slow. So we, I keep less than 140. I don't know. I'm going to have to check the book on keep less than 140. I'm going to see what the goal is for rate control. They usually want the rate slower so that we can at least get decent flow because that ventricle for AFib and A-flutter may be responding rapidly. So AFib can go anywhere from normal, could be 80, could be 120. You'll see people in AFib, they just kind of go up and down because we don't know what the ventricle is going to respond to. So they may be on stuff to keep their rate under control. Um, we saw these two as rate control meds, but now we're going to add amiodarone. Amiodarone is a great drug for any dysrhythmia. So it's a big dysrhythmia drug, and it is wonderful for atrial dysrhythmias. Um, it also works for ventricular dysrhythmias, but it works really well. So we're going to rate control with these meds. So you may see patients that have been in long-time AFib. They go home. They live in AFib. You can live in atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, you can't really live in SVT very long, but you can live in AFib, a flutter. My, my mother-in-law lives in AFib. So they just keep her rate under control because we want to maximize perfusion and a rate less than over 150 is not perfusing. And I'm going to double check because I think the goal is to keep the rate less than 120. I think I typoed, but I'm going to double check with the book on that one and check with a couple of sources. So for usual out in the hospital, Right, we want to keep the rate under 120. Because over 120, we're not flowing well, right? The faster the heart gets, the less it pumps very well. So I'm going to think that we're going to change this to 120, but I'm going to double check first. But just make a note to yourself that I think it's 120, and I'll check back with you. Um, if they are symptomatic, so you may see people where they're like, we can't get that AFib under control, but we're going to send you home with an anticoagulant and you know, a beta blocker and a calcium channel blocker, and you keep your pulse and let me know if your pulse gets high and we may have to switch things. Some people go home on PO amiodarone. It just depends on what their doctor has prescribed for them, but they'll get one of these rate control meds and anticoagulants. But you can live at home in AFib and A-flutter. So if your patient comes in with a history of AFib and these are their home meds, you might want to make sure they get them because if they don't get them, their AFib could, one, they could get clots if they're not getting anticoagulated, and two, they could, um, they could wrap their heart, they could get their heart rate up, especially if they come in the hospital under stress and they have a history of AFib. Dehydration sends people into AFib a lot. So you have a weak heart anyway, and then you get dehydrated, you end up in AFib. So some of it's underlying causes, but we want to make sure they get their anticoagulant rate control, because even stable patients will get these. Um, do we hold them if their heart rate's less than 50? Yes, or less than 80 or whatever your hold parameters are. Yes, we will hold them, but we want to make sure they get them if it's appropriate. Otherwise, they should be getting these things. That's what they go home on, and that's what they should come in and continue on. Of course, if we're not going to be like, well, you have AFib, your heart rate's 60, I'm going to give you your beta blocker. Don't hurt them. <laughs> but if you see the heart rate starting to go up, then that would be appropriate to give them because they do live at home on these two things. If they are worsening, they will keep these meds, their, ox, their anticoagulants and rate control, will top oxygen in because whenever they're symptomatic, we'll give them oxygen. They will keep their anticoagulants going so we don't hold those. Now this heart rate's super fast or flow has been compromised. We certainly want to make sure they keep their anticoagulants going. We want to keep their rate control. They will keep these meds or add them if they don't have them. We add, sometimes they'll be on diltiazem and amiodarone. They'll be on multiple things. They'll be on metoprolol, diltiazem, and amiodarone. We will do multiple things to try and slow that heart rate down if they're starting to get symptomatic. And then there are two special meds for SVT. Because for SVT, 
We have to slow it down before we know what it is. It's just SVT, it's super fast. So we have to slow it down. There is a fun med for SVT called adenosine. It's only for SVT. We don't give it to AFib. We don't give it to A-flutter. We only give it to heart rates greater than 150 that are symptomatic. And it will slow the heart rate down for us. And I'll show you what it does. The first thing we can do before we get an order for SVT, so if your patient comes into you and you are monitoring them and their heart rate pops up to 180, what's the first thing we could go in and do? Tell them to bear down, see if we can get their heart rate down. So your patient's out on a walk. They're having, you know, they're in with some heart failure or something, and they're out on a walk, and they're like, ooh, I feel a little dizzy, a little short of breath. What's the first thing you're going to do? Sit them down, okay? So there's the difference between first and priority. Your priority is going to get their heart rate down. But the first thing you're going to do is safety first. Sit them down, okay? They're feeling dizzy. Sit them down. What's the next thing we can do? When you are having an emergency, go into your ABCs. Sit down. Sit them down. What else can we do for them if they're out on a walk? They're sitting down in the chair. They're huffing. They're about to pass out. Hmm? Yeah, you can have them sit, you can have them, we don't know if it's respiratory, we don't know if it's cardiac. What will help respiratory and cardiac conditions oxygen. if they're not on it already? Oxygen. oxygen. Put them on their oxygen. So your patient is up and wandering down through the hall and they're like, oh, I'm going to pass out, I'm going to go, okay, get them in a chair, sit them down, lay them, sit them on the floor, lay them down, whatever you need to do to get, because we want perfusion, we want to stop the workload on the heart. Sit them down. Get them some oxygen, and then what are you going to do? You're going to check, right? You're going to check your key assessments. You're going to take a pulse. You're going to slip on a pulse ox. Their heart rate's 180, and they are sat in at 93. We don't have orders yet. There is a quick, fast thing that we can do to solve the problem if it works, and that's have them bear down. And you can tell them, hold your breath. You can tell them bear down like you're going to take a dump. Either one. Hold the breaths a little nicer. Like, hold your breath. What is hold your breath going to do? It's going to stimulate that vagal, that rest digest thing, and it's going to slow your heart rate down. You can tell them, hold your breath. They may not be able to hold their breath. Okay, bear down like you're going to the bathroom, like you're going like to poop, you know, and... So, but be careful. <laughs> but that is something that you can do, intervene super fast. You take their pulse, it's 180. Vagal is quick and easy. It may work, it may not work. Their heart rate continues to be 180. You're like, okay, somebody call so-and-so. You know, we're going to need assist. We're going to get them back to bed as soon as we can. Lower the head of the bed. Help perfusion until you can get to your great, your fun med. Um, and I love this. Watch the monitor, because what happens when we give, um, when we give the, uh, the adenosine is we actually stop the heart. It's a chemical cardioversion. So anticoagulant, these are just some the things about the anticoagulants. Hopefully you know about anticoagulants by now. Amiodarone is a new med for you guys, and it is probably our primary antiarrhythmic. Works for atrials, works for ventriculars. So you're going to see amiodarone quite a bit. Um, it's a potassium channel blocker. So guess what it's going to do? What do we need to run electricity around? Potassium. potassium. So guess what it's going to do? It's going to block that, and your rate will slow down. It's not a complete blockage, but it slows things down. So it's a potassium channel blocker, which is why it works great for all <coughs> arrhythmias. Um, if you're giving it IV, there's a bolus and then a continuous drip. And then it goes to a PO dose. So you may see it in any variety, but there is a PO and an IV dose. If you're going to give it IV, I'm not going to make you memorize this, but just if you're on the units, just know that amiodarone does come PO, does come IV, and if they were on it IV, they get converted to PO, and they probably go home with it PO, and then they'll probably need to maintain it. Um, but it does slow everything down, so we would want to monitor continue to monitor the EKG. You're never going to give amiodarone and not monitor your EKG. 
Um, we do expect it to have some side effects, but the worrisome thing is it does because it's a potassium channel blocker. It could block things down a little long. It prolongs that QR interval. And um, if you have hypokalemia, we're going to worry because it's going to block whatever potassium you've got. Um, and so we're going to monitor the potassium level with it as well. And for some reason, I don't know why, it does not work well with grapefruit juice. So I don't know who drinks grapefruit juice. <laughs> but if they have a grapefruit juice habit and they're on amiodarone, they need to stop their grapefruit juice habit. But let's talk about my fun one. Oh, and this is just a reminder of all the rate control meds. Let's talk about the fun one. Uh, there are so many memes out here for it because it is the best drug in the world to watch work. Um, it is only IV push. It is a fast. Has anybody seen it given? No, yes. A couple people do. Yes. Um, what it is, it, it is chemical cardioversion, meaning we stop the heart and restart it. Adenosine stops the heart, but it has a very fast half life. It only works for about 6 to 12 seconds, thank God. <laughs> but in a renal failure or a liver failure patient, its half-life might be a little bit longer, so you've got to watch. But, so if you give adenosine to a jaundice liver failure patient, you definitely want to have the code card in the room. So uh, when we give adenosine, so remember this is only for SVT, and it's only to break SVT to slow down the heart rate, and maybe we can see what's going on underneath it. So adenosine is not our drug for AFib or for a flutter. It's a special drug only for SVT. AFib, a flutter are anticoagulants and rate control and amiodarone. Okay, there's only three things for AFib, a flutter, maybe PACs if there's a lot of them. But this one is our, face, our special one. Um, it does, since it's stopping the heart, it's gonna stop your perfusion for a little while, so they're gonna feel a little sick, they're gonna feel a little woozy. Um, so what they do is they put it with two syringes, one of them with um, the adenosine, one of them with a flush because we want to get it to the heart fast so it can work fast. So we'll give the adenosine and give a flush right after. So it's like a fast flush. You do them right away and you watch the monitor and everybody's And what will happen is that SVT will stop and they may go flat for a couple of seconds and then they come back to a regular rhythm. It is a chemical reset button. So it is fun. So we do um, need a code card nearby if you're administering it because if for some reason it doesn't come back, then, whoops, that was a worrisome side effect is asystole. Uh, that was not what we wanted, but uh, yeah, that's why I love this one. <laughs> <laughs> because and it's great because everybody lets everybody know and you're probably not going to do it on the floor but they do it in the ER a lot they do it in the ICU and it's like we're giving adenosine and everybody's like ooh and they all come down and they're all waiting because it is kind of if you ever get to see if you hear the word adenosine or you have someone come in and the ER does it all the time because they come in an SVT and they're like we don't know what it is slam some adenosine in and so they do it in the ER all the time so have fun if you're in the ER um, hopefully they, they give it, but um, they do have to be hooked up to a monitor, and you do want a code cart nearby because it does stop your heart for a minute. And so patients, you give it, you're going to tell them, you're going to feel a little woozy for a second, and they do. As soon as it hits them, they're like, oh, what was that? And you're like, yeah, that was your heart stopping, and then you're starting again. <laughs> so um, think of adenosine as the power off and on switch. When something's not working, we power it down and reset it, and hopefully it resets within 10 to so, you know, 12 seconds. Did you have a question? What's it? Yeah, you want it getting to the heart fast, so they do want it centrally given or AC or central line. Um, because if you give it, you know, into a peripheral IV, it just doesn't get to the heart very fast before its half-life wears off. It's only gonna work for six to 12 seconds, so if it takes six seconds to get there, it doesn't have any effect when it gets there. So we wanna give it in the AC or central line so that it can get to the heart right away and work. So it's a fun med if you ever get, um, yeah, I like worrisome side effects, asystole. Um, but you can probably watch um, some videos online about uh, what cardioversion looks like, or what um, adenosine looks like on the monitor. Um, cardioversion, so we did medicine. 
before Edison. So remember the Edison for Brady's was a pacemaker. The Edison for this one is cardioversion, which we will hook up and we will give them a shock. But it's not a random shock like defibrillation. It is a little bit lower level, not much lower, but a little bit lower. Um, and they do need their pads on, so it's just like you're doing a code but it's like a planned event. And because it's a planned event, we do this as a, you know, like, okay, we're gonna cardiovert the patient. Um, they put it on, but you need to sedate your patient prior to, because we're about to give them a giant bolt of electricity. So let me see, and I think that's why it didn't work before. Uh, someone said these links work with control click. Let's see if that works. Wow. In the, in the effort of time, I won't show you, but this is, um, this is actually a video of cardioversion, and it's actually pretty fun to watch. So if you control click on your PowerPoint, it will take you to the link. Um, I'm not sure why they're not working on my computer because I have a funky setup. Um, but when you go and watch it, it's a patient who's way sedated, like he's barely responding because they sedated him down, and he wakes right up when they do the cardioversion because he's like, oh, what was that? because it's a jolt of electricity. So we want to sedate our patient because this is a planned procedure. The, uh, if you can't, if your blood pressure is 80 over 40, you might be, you won't sedate them too much because we don't want to drop their blood pressure. But if they, um, you know, we would want to sedate them because we are about to shock them. The difference is that you have to set the defibrillator to watch the heart rate. So it's not something that you would do. So what I'm gonna tell you is if you take ACLS, you are saying that you've learned about these things and you're good to do it. So I would say take ACLS, but just be aware that just because you have it doesn't mean you need to practice it. Because that would be that you know how to open the door on the thing, hit the sync button, and know what you're doing with cardioversion. So I would say even if you were ACLS certified, maybe until you've seen it a couple of times, don't step up into that role because it is a kind of a scary role to hit that sync button and then hit shock because what it's going to do is it's going to wait to shock the patient until the right part in the cardiac cycle we do not want to shock people who have rhythms in the middle of the t the repolarization period if it's after the qrs and before the p and we hit a jolt of electricity there we could set off we could set them into afib or maybe fib we can send them coding if we deliver a jolt of electricity into the wrong part of the cardiac cycle. So in cardioversion, it is synced with the heart rate and you hit shock and it doesn't do it right away. It waits until just the right spot and then it sends the jolt. So watch the video on it. But cardioversion, remember it's planned. It's not part of a code. It's a planned procedure. You should sedate your patient prior to and it needs to be synced with the heart rate. So if you get to watch it, look for those things if you get to watch it in the ER or in the ICU. But cardioversion is our, okay, amiodarone didn't work. Or maybe we gave adenosine, it blocked it down to AFib, and we're like, okay, it's AFib, and then they went right back into SVT, and they're symptomatic. They are basically symptomatic and not responding to the rate control meds or the amiodarone. Then we will move on to cardioverting it. Medicine before Edison. And that's it. Okay, let's take a little break and we'll do the last two. Um, there's only two. And there's only one that matters. The, eight, the premature contractions, don't care, honestly. Don't care that much about them. We don't do anything about them unless there's a lot of them. If there's a lot of premature atrial contractions, we'll treat it as an atrial dysrhythmia. If there's a lot of premature ventricular contractions, we'll treat it as a ventricular arrhythmia, but mostly we just monitor it and just see how many there are. But let's look at them. So this one's easy to identify. The premature atrial contraction was a little confusing because you're like, what? what is it? Well, guess what? We can find this one. No problemo. Where is it? It is right there. This big boy right there. Um, they're wide. Do you see how wide they are? 
When we said narrow normal, narrow is normal. That QRS is only supposed to be like one to three boxes. That's normal. This guy, look how wide this thing is. By the time we get QRS, T, they're like, this is the S right here. That's one, two, three, four. It's getting wide. It's getting weird looking. Okay? Wide, weird, wide, bizarre QRSs or PVCs or, or ventricu ventricular. This is a normal QRS. This is an abnormal QRS. Not normal. Um, we can have any cause for it. Again, it could be. This is basically that the ventricle is getting a little bit deprived of oxygen and it throws like a wacky bead out there. And so there could be injury to the heart muscle, there could be stimulants going on, it could be exercise anxiety. Um, there's a lot of reasons for the dysrhythmias. And this would cause palpitations too. Just like your premature atrial contraction will cause like, whew, that was kind of funny, fluttery feeling, but it goes away. Um, that would be the same with a premature ventricular contraction. It's just something a little off, but hopefully there aren't too many of them. Now, if every other beat or every third beat is a PVC, then we're going to start to have, okay, this is a ventricular arrhythmia. There's still premature ventricular contractions, but there's a lot of them. We may treat them if they're affecting flow and causing symptoms. Okay? So... This is more PVC, and really, how do you identify it? It's regular, except for one really wide, bizarre beat. Just like the PAC was regular, except for a beat that was kind of out of place without a P wave, and you weren't sure. It was like an abnormal P, but a narrow normal QRS, we'll call it a PAC. But here, this is pretty obvious what a PVC is. You can have multifocal PVCs, which means they're wide, weird, and they all look different. You can have multiple kinds of PVCs. You can have PVCs, but they're all wide and weird, and they don't have a P wave before them. So is it regular? Well, yes, except for that thing. I'm not really sure what's that, you know. As soon as you see one of these wide, weird things, it goes right into your ventricular pile, okay? This is a ventricular rhythm, wide and weird. You don't have to think about it. You don't even really have to analyze this EKG. You're like, okay, regular, regular, why we are, there's something ventricular going on, but everything else is regular. So we're going to keep this P wave before every QRS, except that wide weird thing, P wave before every P, a P wave before every QRS. Sorry, I'm getting behind it, my brain's not working. Um, P wave before every QRS, and it seems to be otherwise regular, except for this wide weird thing. And um, the only that's narrow, normal, except for one wide, weird thing. PVC. Just put it in the ventricular pile and call it a premature ventricular contraction. We will only treat it if it is symptomatic and there's a lot of them. Okay. All right. Where's the other one go? Did I skip a page? This one. Ooh. We want to shock the heck out of that one. Except you don't. Um, this is VTAC. And what does it look like in addition, you know, like if it had normal QRSs in between? If it had narrow normal QRSs, what would this look like? A flutter. If it had narrow normal QRSs popping up in between? Because that's atrial tachycardia is what a flutter is. But this is, there's no atrial involvement whatsoever. There's no P wave. And it's pretty regular, don't you think? It fits the regular category. Sure, it's regular. But there's no P wave. And it's wide and weird, right? We're calling that wide and weird. There's no P waves. There's no P waves at all. And it's wide and weird QRS, but it's somewhat regular. So we're like, well, dang. So it's called VTAC. What we're going to do with it depends on whether they have a pulse and they're stable. Okay? I've had people that have runs of VTAC or are in VTAC, and we all go tear into the room with the code cart, and they're like, what? And we're like, nothing. How you feeling? 
How you doing? You feeling okay? And they're like, well, I'm a little, a little dizzy maybe. And you take their blood pressure and it's low or something like that. They are symptomatic, but they might not be coding. They might be. This is a, what a VTAC can be pulsed or pulseless. You have to check your patient. So they're like, what do you do for VTAC? Well, it depends on whether they have a pulse or not. It changes our whole outlook on life, whether they have a pulse or not. Um, so a ventricular dysrhythmia that we would need to treat as a ventricular dysrhythmia would be different than a code. Well, do you walk into the room and this patient's doing okay? Or maybe they're having runs of VTAC. They're having a long run of VTAC and then they flip back into AFib. And you're like, ooh, that was weird. I don't like that. Of course we're going to monitor that because this is getting bad. This means this ventricle is just starting to take over and it's doing it kind of at a fast rate. But the atrium is no longer involved. So something's really wrong and we need to watch. But it is not necessarily a code rhythm. Could be a code rhythm if you walk in and your patient's positive Q sign. <laughs> if your patient's not responsive, it's a code. If they're responsive, it's a ventricular arrhythmia. Okay, so you got to go in. Now, if they're symptomatic or asymptomatic, that's going to depend. If it was a run of VTAC and you walk in and they're like, oh, I'm feeling fine, and you take a blood pressure and it's fine and they're not short of breath and they're not dizzy, then we will monitor it. If it is a run of VTAC and you walk in and their blood pressure is low and they're short of breath and they're, they're having perfusion issues, then we will treat it. So VTAC looks like regular sawtooth, but there's no normal narrow QRSs. It's sawtooth pattern with no narrow normal QRSs is VTAC. Sawtooth pattern with a um, narrow normal QRS is a flutter. But this is also a kind of VTAC. You can see how it gets big and it gets small and it gets big and it gets small. That one's called torsades. And that's from an electrolyte abnormality. Which one is it? Do you remember? It's magnesium. This is a hypomagnesemia will cause this kind of VTAC. So this one we would actually treat with magnesium because torsades is a magnesium deficiency. But anyway, VTAC or any ventricular. So whether we have multiple PAVCs that are causing flow issues or non-flow issues. We have an irritable heart. The ventricle is not supposed to fire unless it's being told to by the atrium, right? The atrium sends a signal and then the ventricle fires. The ventricle's not supposed to fire on its own. And when the ventricle fires on its own, it makes these wide weird beats. So premature ventricular contractions are an irritable heart. This ventricle is irritable for some reason. There's something irritable about it, and we usually will monitor it, or we will give it an antiarrhythmic to stop it from being so irritable. Um, we do need to look at the electrolytes, because a lot of times when the heart gets irritable, it's because it's low on its electrolytes. So we will see PACs and PVCs, and the treatment for it is to fix the electrolytes. Because whenever your heart is having irritable rhythms, a lot of times it's because there's an electrolyte deficiency. But if we have PVCs or VTAC with a pulse, we will treat it with antiarrhythmics, and we recognize the amiodarone from before, our potassium channel blocker, so we may be giving antiarrhythmics. The other one is lidocaine. Lidocaine is an antiarrhythmic that only works on the ventricle. It doesn't really work on the atrium, so we're not going to give it to an atrial arrhythmia, but we will give it to a ventricle. Arrhythmia, excuse me. And then it's Edison is cardioversion. So I didn't put amiodarone up there again. You have amiodarone on your atrial side, but lidocaine is a sodium channel blocker. So they all just working different ways. We're just trying to decrease the irritability of the heart. Um, it is used for ventricular arrhythmias. Again, I'm not going dysrhythmias. I'm not going to test you on the doses, but I put them up there in case you're taking ACLS or you want ACLS because ACLS will test you on the doses. But I'm not training you to be ACLS providers. I'm training you to be decent, competent nurses. So um, I'm not going to test you on the doses. 
Um, but I do want you to know the names of the drugs and which rhythms they go with. So if you have multiple PVCs or a lot of PVCs that are symptomatic or VTAC, runs of VTAC or per persistent VTAC, um, if it is symptomatic, we will probably give it an antiarrhythmic. Okay, oxygen and it's antiarrhythmics. And if we can't um, do anything with it, I didn't put the cardioversion slide back there, but if we can't do anything with it, it's Edison as cardioversion as well because this is a pulsed rhythm. So pulsed rhythms, if we're going to give electricity to a pulsed rhythm, it has to be done while we're monitoring the rhythm, and it has to be synced with the heart rate. So pulsed patients get cardioversion as their electricity. Bradycardias get a pacemaker, but pacemaker is not appropriate for atrial dysrhythmias or ventricular dysrhythmias. We will go ahead and cardiovert those dysrhythmias. Does that make sense? It seems like, wow, for VTAC, that's it, but it is. If your patient's in VTAC and they have a pulse, then we just give them antiarrhythmics because there's an irritable problem and we need to decrease the irritability, slow down that conduction, and slow down the irritability. Replace the electrolytes and give them their, give them their antiarrhythmics. Okay? And if they don't respond to electrolytes, antiarrhythmics, then we'll go ahead and shock them. But it has to be a synchronized shock, something that goes with the heart rate because they have a heartbeat. We want to make sure that we're not shocking them in the wrong part of the heartbeat. Okay? And then we have dead. Oh, let's go through diet again. <laughs> then we have dead. All four of these, your patient is dead. Okay? And they are a code blue. So if you have VTAC without a pulse, um, VFib, asystole, or pulseless electrical activity, all of those four patients are dead. No questions, they're dead because they don't have a pulse. So you will see, we can identify it, check for a pulse, it's all exactly the same, except there's no pulse. The heart rate will look exactly the same. The way you treat it depends on whether they have a pulse or whether they don't have a pulse. If they have a pulse, we'll give this arrhythmias, and oxygen, and electrolytes, and cardioversion. If they don't have a pulse, we go straight to code blue. Okay? Asystole, or this is V-fib. Now, you may want to call this one V-tac, but look how irregular it is. It's like kind of like all over the place. Um, see how there's like little ones, big ones. It's not corsage where it's like big, and then it gets small, and then it gets big again. This one is called coarse V-fib. This one is called fine V-fib. This is coarse V-fib. And then there's just like a wave. Any ventricular activity that is unorganized is called V-fib. Okay? So you can see the difference between V-fib and V-tac. These are pretty organized looking. You don't like it, but at least it's organized and regular. They're all doing the same thing, right? Even though it's wide and weird and crazy. They're all doing the same thing. This one is just junk. It's unorganized activity. It's called V-fib. So when you're going through practice EKGs and stuff, if you don't know what it is, I mean, it's wide and weird. There's no P wave. There's, I don't even know if that's a QRS. It's completely unorganized activity. We're just going to call it V-fib. Okay? There's coarse V-fib. There's fine V-fib. Do we care? It's all pulseless. All ventricular fibrillation is pulseless, and so we would treat it as a code. Um, so when you go to check your patient to see if they're symptomatic or asymptomatic, they're going to be pretty dang symptomatic, and they'll be dead. Um, <laughs> this one is asystole. Asystole could be flatline or just barely not flatline, but it's pretty undulation. People will argue over whether that's fine V-fib or... Um, asystole, but it's basically a flat line. There's no more activity going on. Um, but they're dead as well. And then pulseless electrical activity. I did not put a picture of pulseless electrical activity up there because there's electrical, electrical activity on our monitor. Could be normal sinus rhythm. Could be AFib. Could be SVT. Could be bradycardia. But when you go in to check your patient to ask them if they're symptomatic or asymptomatic, they are the ultimate symptomatic. 
They're dead. I don't care what's on your monitor. They're dead. So you can see what all the interventions for all these will be. So I don't have a picture of it because it could be any rhythm. And that's happened to me before where we're just plopping along at a rhythm and I'm going in to assess my patient and I was like, hey, how's your day? What's going on? Hey. 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 And you're flat line on your A-line and you're like, is my A-line correlating? And you're like, draw, you know, you're doing a blood pressure, and then you're like, oh, dang. Oh, dang. I think that A-line is right. It's flat. Because there's no pumping going on, but their EKG was normal. So it takes a few minutes, because you're like, hey, hey, no. No, 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 no. Your A-line's just dampened, right? Hey. Yeah, and they are actually dead. So you can have a perfectly normal rhythm. And a dead patient. So, of course, hey, guess what their perfusion's going to look like? Yeah, it's not going to be very good. They are unresponsive pulse nick and apneic. I have had that happen. And I'm like, but they have, they have a rhythm. No. Oh, no. So, the treatment for all dead people. <laughs> I mean, it's right, right? It's what we're going to do for anybody who's dead, regardless of the rhythm. I don't care if it's V-fib, I don't care if it's asystole, I don't care if it's anything. Now, when you go to ACLS, they will tell you, oh, yes, you do not defibrillate asystole. You know what? For you guys, I don't care. The treatment is call the cold blue, start your CPR, get the oxygen into the patient. You're not going to intubate them, but get oxygen on your patient somehow, whether it's bagging them you know, I mean, they're not breathing, so a mask isn't going to do a whole heck of a lot to them. We're going to have to CPR and bag them. So ABCs, get the CPR going, get the oxygen on them, place the pads. As a bedside provider, not in a critical care unit, not ACLS certified, you only have to do the first four. Okay, get the AED on them. You may follow the directions on the AED. The AED will assess the rhythm and decide whether a shock is appropriate or not. We only shock V-fib and pulseless V-tac because those have some kind of electrical activity still about them. Okay, PEA and asystole, we do not shock. But again, I'm not gonna test you on that because that's really kind of when you start intervening and doing ACLS, then we decide whether to shock or not shock. But the AED will do that for you if you are BLS. So your focus is going to be call the code blue, start CPR, start bagging your patient, and put on the pads and get the AD going if you can. Um, and that's what you're going to do. If you, go into, um, if you go into ACLS, then we will start doing code drugs in between. So I have put them there, but I did not bold them because I won't test you on the non-bolded stuff. I'm not going to test you on doses, on drugs, but hey, you can see that you already know two of these drugs. They're the antiarrhythmics, so we're gonna do that. There are two other drugs. Epi is just blam. We're just gonna stimulate the heck out of the body and try and get something working. And vasopressin actually helps us retain some fluid, and it's a hormone, and they've been shown to, to help your blood pressure in a code situation. But these are some extra things. And they change these meds every five years. I've done ACLS for 20 years, and it used to be shock, shock, everybody shock, little shock, big shock, because we used to do lidocaine, and then um, it was everybody shock, so it was epi, lidocaine, bertillium, and then there was bicarb, and then they change them all the time. And now there's like, now it's just epi. 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 Okay, well, you can try amiodarone, two doses. And then you can try these other things if you want, if you're bored. But I mean, they really, they don't, they're just like, there's not that much out there anymore. They found that a lot of the things we were giving them weren't making a big difference. And they'll probably find out that most of these things we're doing aren't gonna make a big difference either. None of these meds really do a lot of work other than probably the epi. I mean, if you're antiarrhythmic, we're trying to throw things at you to remove the irritability, like the amiodarone and lidocaine, but this is a super irritable heart to the point where it's not pumping anymore. So there's probably an underlying cause, and that is the, really the core of ACLS, is those H's and T's and the underlying cause, because when we get down to a code, 
you're saving the patient with CPR and oxygen. That's what saves the patient. Early defibrillation, if we can get that rhythm back, will help. So if we can defibrillate them, this does not need to be synced. You just shock it and try it because it's already in the worst case scenario. It's already in V-fib, V-tac. So we don't care if it puts them into V-fib, V-tac. They're already there. But for pulsed rhythms, we want to sync it so that it doesn't send us into V-fib, V-tac. So if it's AFib or SVT or VTAC with a pulse, we're going to cardiovert. But if they're dead, we will defibrillate. So dead people get defibrillation. You also notice that this is the only time electricity comes, Edison comes before medicine is when they're dead. If they are alive, we're going to try medicines first before we do electricity. But if they are dead, electricity first. But your job is CPR and oxygen and getting pads on to do an early defib. And then the rest of it is basically just fix the problem. So the um, defibrillator, you probably have done this in sim already, so I'm not going to go over it. But that's just to remind you of what defibrillation is. And these are the H's and T's. Again, not testable. But if you are in ACLS or you're going to the critical care environment, so the ED, this is the core of what you're doing on a dead patient, is figuring out what went wrong. There's only, what, nine things? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 things that can kill you. There they are. Those are the 12 things that can kill you or make your heart stop. So there's your 12 things. You learn those 12 things and you keep those 12 things from happening, your patient won't die, ever. So if you want a super short nursing school course, it's this. Keep your patients away from the H's and the T's, and they will never die. Except maybe of old age. But if you could think of a cause of death that is not one of these, let me know, and we'll add it to the H's and T's. But these are the 12 causes of death. So... Really, all of nursing school is staying away from these things. All of ICU care is keeping these things under control and staying away from them because then your patient won't die. And then hopefully they'll get better. But when we are coming to a code and you're CPRing and bagging, we're going to ask a ton of questions because we need to get to the bottom of what caused the death. Twelve things caused death. What was it so that we can reverse it? If you really want nursing in a nutshell, there it is. Um, but yeah, these are the things that will, will kill you. So you can see that hypovolemia can kill you. Hypoglycemia can kill you. Um, you know, so you can go through that. But again, I'm not going to test you on the H's and T's, but that is the core of what we're trying to avoid. And here is your summary slide which I ended up making last semester when we did the review class for people who wanted extra um, stuff. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I was being so confusing when it's really this simple. Um, all the Brady's, the blocks, like I said, the blocks can have any rhythm, but the problem that we treat them, we treat them with the Brady's. So if they're causing us symptoms, we will treat them bradycardically. So um, heart rate less than 60, if they're asymptomatic, keep an eye on them. Um, and when we say monitor, it's all those key assessments, EKG, blood pressure, electrolytes, cardiac diagnostic testing, all those things that we're going to do along with just making sure that they're not becoming symptomatic, pulse ox. If they are symptomatic, oxygen, atropine, dopamine, pacemaker. All the Brady's fit there. All the blocks fit there. Okay, that's the treatment for all the blocks. Maybe not in that order. If you go through the blocks, you'll see that third degree heart block will go straight to pacemaker. They don't bother medicating it. But I'm not, like I said, again, testing you on the blocks. But if you do go into ICU or ED or take ACLS, you, will, you can clear that up, which ones go with which blocks. Um, but all those interventions match the bradycardic intervention. The atrial dysrhythmias, they're usually irregular, not all 100%. I'm never going to give you 100%. There's never a sure situation now that you're in block four. Um, but they are usually irregular. The P waves, there's something missing with them, or there's, uh, you know, one missing before the QRS. They're not quite right. But all the QRSs are narrow normal. 
So they're all within that one to three box, okay? They're pretty narrow normal. You can pretty much put it in the atrial category. Um, asymptomatic, we'll make sure that their rate's under control. If their rate is under control, we don't need to worry about giving them a rate control med. But if their rate has been popping up into the high range, they'll probably give them something to control their rate, and they'll get an anticoagulant. And then if they are symptomatic, they'll get all those plus oxygen and amiodarone. Okay. Does that make sense? And then they'll get cardioversion as their Edison. Ventricular dysrhythmias. If they're asymptomatic, we may give them something to decrease the irritability of the heart just because we're worried about something getting worse. So they may get amiodarone or lidocaine, but that's because there's multiple VVCs. They're irritable. They've had runs of VTAC, but they're not, they're not symptomatic yet. We're not going to really wait for them to get symptomatic. We'll probably do something to decrease the irritability of the heart. So um, they'll probably put them on amiodarone or lidocaine, just something to maintain them, and then we'll watch. And then if they end, oxygen's on the table for everything, but definitely if they're asymptomatic. Any cardiac patient is probably on some level of oxygen. But um, if they are symptomatic, definitely oxygen and synchronized cardioversion. So if you have a patient having runs of VTAC and their SAT's 98, they don't have to be on oxygen. They may be on oxygen, but they don't have to be. But as soon as they're short of breath or their SAT starts to drop, we would definitely put them on oxygen. And then cardioversion, and then there's the code blue. So that's it. You got this? I think you got this. What we're going to do is um, look at a couple of, let me go to the, I'll show you the ABG Ninja site. Um, and I have some questions. We'll start off the next class with the questions. Let's see. Also, if you guys want to do the ACLS, please stay after for a minute and you get head counseling. Where are you going to do ACLS? Um, through home prevention. Any of them are good. They all it, make sure it's American Heart Association. Okay, make sure a lot of hospitals won't take anything other than American Heart Association ACLS. So make sure it's that way. Um, but if you Google ABG Ninja EKG, um, you can go there. Um, uh, well, they have a description one, but they also have. Don't they have one with a rhythm? Oh, well, you can go through here. They had one with a rhythm. What was the one that I learned with the rhythm? There will be a few rhythms, but I will tell you it'll be, um, they won't be that tricky. They'll be pretty straightforward. Uh, maybe it's this practical clinical skills one. Yes, it's this one. This one's the one. ABG Ninja has them, but they describe the rhythm to you, and you have to guess, or you have to guess from their thing. Um, 